the Beastman Army, or, well, technically, Warherd, is, um, an interesting force. Like, why would you want to play this in tabletop? Well, in tabletop you'd want to play this because it's a fair few very tough creatures, and you have some very competent melee fighters and some extremely tough monsters, plus you have a ton of units that are capable of arriving in ambush, which is a special rule. The Beastmen have two special rules, the first being Primal Fury. What this does is that every time a unit with the Primal Fury special rule is in melee combat with an enemy unit, it rolls a leadership test. And if they successfully pass the leadership test, then for the remainder of that combat turn, they are subject to the special rule Hatred, which means they get to re-roll failed to hit rolls on a d6. This means that your average beastman unit can actually be damn good at fighting, far better at fighting than their stat line might originally suggest, and combine this with their other special rule, Beastman Ambush, which allows a vast number of their units to be held in reserve, and then be moved onto the board from your opponent's table edge, or even directly behind him, the Beastmen are a considerable threat to any army in Warhammer, although after the whole uh, Matt Ward apocalypse, they have certainly uh, fallen from grace, shall we just say. And if you're curious what the whole Matt Ward apocalypse was, just um, just Google the name Matt Ward, and you will get far more information than you will be comfortable with. But back to the Beastman's ambush. In tabletop, essentially, let's say you have two units in reserve, yeah? These two units, every turn, you roll a dice on a d6, and you can get various results. Now, let's say that on the first unit, you roll the dice and it successfully appears, which means that you have rolled 4, 5, or 6. The unit appears on the board. And if you roll 1, 2, or 3, the unit fails to appear. However, there are some... Uh, larger effects in play, depending on what you roll. If you roll a 1, the beastmen have lost the set. The unit enters from the table edge of the opponent's choosing, which is usually going to be way at the back of your own deployment zone, which means that that unit probably isn't even going to get to fight the whole battle, which sucks pretty damn badly. 2 and 3, the unit is still getting into position, and so they can't show up this time, but they might show up next turn. On a roll of 4, the unit arrives on the table edge to the Beastman players are left. On a roll of 5, they appear on the table edge to the Beastman players are right. And on a roll of 6, the Beastman player chooses which board edge they will arrive from, which means that they could arrive directly behind the enemy army. Now, I've talked a little bit about how these units could be implemented in Total War games previously with the whole ambush thing, but for an entire army based around ambush, I don't honestly know. I would really, really kind of like to play that as the Beastman, as it would be a really cool kind of guerrilla warfare campaign where you have to hit and run and retreat into your hidden lairs in the forests and do all kinds of cool shit could be really interesting. But I suspect that they would be completely and utterly unplayable in multiplayer, simply because you could have half your army just pop up behind the enemy arm and go like, well, you're boned, aren't you? So, yeah, that'd be problematic. But as a pure single-player race, the Beastmen could be pretty damn cool. Especially considering that with the AI being as aggressively bullheaded as it always has, arriving directly behind the enemy army might not be such a massive uh, advantage as it originally sounds, simply because more often than not the AI is simply going to turn around and, well, bum rush you, so, you know, you really do have to time the entrance a bit so that you don't arrive way before the main force does. As for the Primal Fury special rule, well, 
I think generally we're just gonna say that as long as a unit has not been broken, so it has not been broken once and has fled, they're subject to fry Primal Fury. Which means they are very, very angry, and they will do bonus damage. But once they've run away once, let's just say that they've noticed that the enemy has sharp weapons as well, and are not quite as keen to throw themselves directly at them again, and therefore they take a little bit of a melee damage uh, deficit, maybe? Deficit's the wrong word. A little bit of a melee damage penalty, I suppose. It could be interesting and wouldn't be uh, too problematic to implement in a Total War game, I would think. But who do I think would command the Beastmen? Well, that's a little bit of a hard question. There are some pretty damn good candidates, but honestly, I think it would have to be Morgo. Simply because he is essentially considered to be the prophet of the gods, their chosen aspect in this world, because he is constantly changing, he is constantly mutating and warping, and even just being close to him bears a considerable threat of being turned into a chaos spawn. And with the Beastmen being a deeply religious race, it seems fitting that the Archpriest, the uh, the very embodiment of their deity ought to be their leader. The problem, of course, is that Morkur is um, a bit problematic to implement. You probably couldn't do his special rule, for example, that just randomly turns friendly models into chaos spawns, because, yeah, that'd be um, problematic to implement, I think. But just implementing him as a pretty powerful magic type general, a mage, basically, um, could be done, he'd be interesting. Tons of buffs, tons of movement enhancing spells, and a uh, huge aura for leadership, because the beastmen are fighting in the presence, practically, of their gods, you know. Uh, that could work, he wouldn't be the worst choice anyways. But then again, you're playing beastmen, do you really want a mage as your primary general? So, I'm not sure. But my, uh quote, expert, quote, opinion, is probably gonna have to go with Morgur, just because, you know, messenger of the gods and all of that. But moving on to the heroes sections, we start out with the juicy part of the Beastman list, the Beast Lord. The Beast Lord is the leader of a particular warherd, and as such, he is by far the biggest and the baddest individual in that particular warherd. And um, I'd probably point out that while he is technically the leader, he doesn't really lead, you know? The Beast Lord doesn't give a shit about the fact that the vast majority of his dudes are starving to death. He doesn't care. He just walks around and fights people, and uh, if a lot of other gores will follow him, well, also the betters. He can fight more people at once, and he can beat down more of those puny man things, wonderful little structures. In game terms, though, the Beast Lord is a truly magnificent melee fighter. Weapon skill of 6, strength 5, toughness 5, and 3 wounds, plus 4 attacks, means that he is one of the finest combat lords in the entire game. He's very tough, he hits very hard, and he hits a lot. And he buffs up any unit he is joined with his special rule, Man Bane. When fighting against any unit from the Empire or Britannia, well, honestly, I'm a little bit surprised that they don't count elves, considering that, well, if they really hate the shiny ass humans, they ought to really, really dislike the shiny ass elves, but oh well, I didn't write the book. But yeah, if he's leading the unit, they get to re roll any failed Primal Fury tests, which means that a unit he joins is virtually guaranteed to always have Primal Fury, thereby always having hatred, which means that he gets to re-roll all of those attacks. So potentially, you've got a front line of units that can dish out anything from 
8 to 12 odd high strength reasonable weapon skill attacks. So he is pretty damn powerful if you put him in the front of a unit, and honestly, why wouldn't you want to have him in the front of a unit? That's what he does, he stomps things along with his mates. So, you know, a pretty damn good hero. And probably pretty simple to implement in a total war game. Now, again, we don't actually know how they're going to be implementing heroes. We've seen Karl Franz on a Griffin, which suggests that they might implement heroes as singular units. We've also seen Manfred von Karsten on a dragon, so... You know, the big bad special units will probably be units onto themselves, but... I mean, Karl Franz can't lead every army. You've got to have some of the down-to-earth um, leaders, so there's got to be a system for them. I do hope that you can assign them to units, just because, well, that's how Warhammer works, so... We will hope and we will assume for now, simply because, well, it's a hell of a lot simpler to just work with that as a framework. And moving on, though, we come to the, uh, perhaps tastiest of all the special characters for the Beastmen, the Doom Bull. Doom Bulls are, as you can probably tell, giant ass violent minotaurs that eat pretty much anything they come across, as long as it's got a heartbeat and they can catch it. It's probably good to point out that the Doom Bull is technically a wee bit more intelligent than the basic Minotaur, although that's not by much. If you think of a Minotaur as a proper retard, barely able to open a door, the Doom Bull is the kind of retard that realizes that he could just open the door by kicking it in. So, you know, intelligent is probably not the correct word. But you don't really need intelligent, because the Doom Bull is not there for philosophical debates. He's there to beat the shit out of anything that is stupid enough to get in his way, and he's pretty damn good at it. Weapon skill 6, strength 6, toughness 5, with 5 wounds and 5 attack. Add to that the fact that he's such a big old bastard that he causes impact hits, D3 impact hits. So under the charge, he essentially has 8 attacks. And with 5 wounds, it's damn hard to put the bastard in the ground as well. And he's probably the best non-special character, just book standard hero fighter in the game. Now, granted, a properly kitted out Chaos Lord might beat him, but pound for pound with no magical equipment, the Doom Bull is a right proper monster. That even an Ogre Tyrant is going to be thinking twice about messing with. Especially considering the Ogre Tyrant has a ton of flab on himself, and the Doom Bulls are very, very hungry creatures. As for uh, availability, though, like you can have as many beast lords as you want, really. They they are essentially just your standard general. Doom bulls are a bit rare, as well. You can make the argument that doom bulls are essentially minotaurs that have been specially blessed by the chaos gods. That's why they're just the tiniest percentage more intelligent than their usual minotaur brethren. So perhaps they should be a little rarer? And with that kind of stat line, I'm kind of thinking that you should have like a special Doom Bull. Perhaps even the Brass Bull himself, who is a special character. He is essentially a particularly angry Doom Bull, but he's also made primarily out of metal, which, you know, that makes him pretty damn hard to kill. But. That could kind of be cool, like you have uh, Morgor as your primary leadership type general, and then he works together with the Brass Bull. Could be interesting. Then again, assuming that there will be a system for adding magical doodahs to your heroes, I really do want Doom Bulls though. Just for the sheer amount of carnage you can do with one. There's just a special satisfaction, isn't it? in just building this perfect hero, you know? This perfect character. You've been leveling him for days upon days, and you've kitted him out with the 
best stuff you could steal, scavenge and craft, and now he's just this glorious slaughter beast just butchering entire units by himself, so... I, I kind of want that. I do kind of want that. But maybe you should only have two or something, because while technically the Doom Bull is not supposed to be the generally type, well, the base lords were not really the generally type either, so... The fact that the Doom Bull has leadership of eight still makes him a pretty good leader, so maybe give him just some relatively large minuses when it comes to his leadership aura, or maybe he just simply can't rally troops or something like that. Might work, might work. Before I spend too much time on the gloriousness that this is the Doom Bull, though, let's proceed to the Bray Shaman. Now, the Bray Shaman is, of course, a shaman, a wizard. But he's not terrible at fighting. Weapon skill 5, toughness 5, 3 wounds, and strength 4, with 2 attack. You can have this guy in the front line of a unit, not worry too much about him, but of course doing that you will give up on his potential for magic. Now, the Brain Shaman is not a fantastic caster when it comes to just good old fashioned blowy up magic, although he does have access to the Lore of Death and the Lore of Shadow, so he does have access to some offensive spells, certainly, but his true power comes in his access to the Lore of the Wild and Beasts, which allows him to buff his fellow units. He could increase the already considerable strength of a unit of gores, making them into superb monster killers. He could allow them to regenerate hit points, or perhaps move faster and have more of a charge impact. There are a lot of potentials to make a Bray Shaman a really interesting buffing hero that could really bring out the hidden potential of a melee army like the Beastmen, seeing as they technically only have one dedicated-ish ranged attack, and even that's not really much of a ranged attack, really. The basemen don't use a whole lot of ranged weapons. The Ungor Raiders, which I will touch upon later, do use bows, but they're kind of terrible at them, and why you would waste space and points in a beastman army on Ungor Raiders, I I'm unsure, except if you're using them as cannon fodder, I suppose, but oh well. Back to the point, the, the Bray Shaman is a very nice buffing hero, but again, as we don't know how magic is actually going to work, I'm just quietly going to move on for the moment. And into the uh, core section of the Beastmen, where we start out with uh, the Gores. Now, your standard unit of Gores is a pretty damn straightforward unit. It's a nice, big, effective melee unit with movement 5, which means that they're faster than your average human because, you know, goat legs and all of that. And they're pretty damn good in a fight with weapon skill 4, strength 3, toughness 4, but only one wound and one attack, of course. Uh, perhaps the biggest drawback is the initiative of three, which means that quite a lot of things are going to be hitting them first. And uh, with only one wound, and not much in the way of armor to speak of, that can be damn painful. And in fact, I would probably say that the High Elves is a bit of a nightmare army for the Beastmen to fight, simply because a nice, big, fat unit of High Elf Spearmen can just obliterate a unit of Gauls before they even get to strike once, so that's a problem. But in Total War, though, I think you could do a bit more around that, particularly because they do not fight using organized tactics, and uh, this is perhaps the most interesting thing about the Beastmen army. The Beastmen do not form organized regiments. They don't form nice little rectangles and squares and move alongside each other in organized units. They are groups of warriors. 
Ideally, I would like to see the system from Rome 1 and Medieval 2 return, where these unorganized units are essentially just organized in a haphazardly spaced uh, spherical formation, or circular would probably be more correct, so that they don't really have a formation, so to say. It should really just be a large, organic group of beastmen straining at the leash to charge their enemy. And this could have some interesting effects though. For example, let's say you make the beastmen unit um, a lot wider than most other units, so that if you try to fight them in a compact formation, the beastmen will hit the front and then lap around the enemy unit. Because that's kind of how the base beastmen fight, you know? They overwhelm their enemy. They don't outgrind them through tactics or regimented combat. They overwhelm them with numbers. Something that the current Total War engine is not very good at actually doing, so... Uh, it'll be interesting to see how they're actually going to solve that. Though, then again, that assumes that the Beastmen are going to be playable, or even in the game, which we don't know, but, you know, good old-fashioned speculation is pretty much what I do here in the possible factions videos, so take it with a grain of salt as always, but then again, if you're watching this and you saw the possible faction title, and you still somehow think I have some kind of insight into this, uh, yes, you are in the wrong place, my friend. But before I alienate too much more of my audience, let's uh, quietly move on, shall we? The next unit are the Ungors. Now, the Ungors are precisely that, as I explained in the Beastman video. They are not Gors, and as such, they are quite different when it comes to their stat line. Well, the different, as in significantly worse. Weapon skill 3, strength, toughness of 3, with the same single point of wounds and 3 initiative. Their primary advantage is the simple fact that they're really, really cheap, and they get to be equipped with spears and shields. The standard gauze do not get to have a shield. They have two melee weapons, which of course adds a bit to their combat potential, but it also means that they make excellent pincushions. Now, a unit of Ungors, if you think of it as a proper unit of regimented individuals, would actually not be a bad fighting force, but it is not. The Ungors have received no formal training, they have not been taught how to fight side by side. They haven't the faintest about how to protect the man next to him with his shield, for example. They fight just in an unorganized herd, much like the Gores. This is represented in-game essentially by the simple fact that they have pretty much no confidence whatsoever in the Ungor next to them, giving them a rather abysmal leadership of six. So it does not take a lot at all to make these bastards reevaluate their current position and decide that they would be much, much safer hiding in the forest shades. So you really gotta be careful with them because they will run away quickly and they will run away often and to the point where their spears are somewhat superfluous because you go like, okay, they got spears, so they'll be good against cavalry, right? Well, yes, except for the fact that after a unit of Empire Super Heavy Knights have hammered through their front ranks, odds are that the rest of them are going to decide that, you know, this was a terrible idea, and I'd be much better off back in the forest again. They also don't have armor. All they have is that tiny-ass wooden shield, so again, dedicate a decent amount of archers taking care of them, and they're going to be running away very, very quickly. So, I would almost say that the Ungors could be a bit of a special unit. Now, this depends, though, again, on whether or not the Beastmen would actually be playable, because the Gores are decent enough fighters, you can have them in a unit of 120, not too much problems. The Ungors you'd want in a unit of 240, and um, I would I would almost kind of like to see them as a free unit. Like, every hero in your army, every general, so to say, 
brings with him a retinue of Ungors. Like, a really high level general, for example, has a special ability in his general tree that allows him to have five units of Ungors. And they're just terrible at fighting. No armor, small shields, crappy stat lines. They are there to be chaff units. Because you don't want to use chaff units, really. You want to keep your army in one piece and fighting. So the best thing, in my opinion, to represent chaff units would be to have them be something that is generated as an additional unit in your army rather than a dedicated unit. But, of course, whether or not that is even doable in a total war game or if it would completely break balance or anything because of course at that point you could go like oh but then i'll just like take like six heroes that can take four units each and i'll just swamp you and yeah is definitely exploitable but um we'll have to see if they're just going to be a normal unit make them a 240 strength unit that you really kind of need to babysit with a general to make sure they stay in fight because they are just super light spear infantry really and they don't have the benefits of organized formations which makes them even more vulnerable to the very thing they are supposed to be fighting cavalry so you know could be a bit problematic certainly and much the same thing goes for the next core unit the ungor raiders the plus to the ungor raiders is the simple fact that they are even cheaper than the standard Ungors, so they make fantastic cannon fodder. I mean, scatter a bunch of these little bastards out in front of your army and they will eat the vast majority of the missile of fire that was intended for your proper units. Of course, they're not going to be doing, well, practically anything when it comes to damage to the actual enemy, but you know, they they might nab themselves an infantryman here and there with their crappy ass bows, but in all due reality they are chaff. So again, I'd like a system where you got them as free units via your general, but uh, otherwise make them a 240 unit that can only skirmish and just make their ranged attacks really, really, really terrible because, well, they're pretty damn bad at it. Their short bows and terrible aiming skill leaves a fair bit to be desired, let's just say. And again, they have no armor, not even light armor. They are quite literally naked, so their only real defense against enemy ranged weapons is to not get hit, which is Easier said than done, considering you are a relatively large and a remarkably ugly individual. They also have the um, relatively paltry leadership of six, so again, they're going to be running away pretty damn fast. And next up, we have another chaff unit, so I'm assuming you're starting to see a bit of a uh, theme here. It is the Chaos Warhounds. Now, the Chaos Warhound is a somewhat misleading name. They're not really just mutated doggies. They are closer to extremely heavily mutated wolves, probably. They're bigger and more ferocious than most dogs, and at the very least any dog I've ever seen. And thank the heavens for that. And they're also considerably more dangerous. A dog with a strength of three and a toughness of three, meaning that this doggy is as strong as a man. So, yeah, they're a bit dangerous, and they of course move really, really fast. Now, the primary advantage of Warhounds is, again, that they're cheap, and you can use them as effective chaff. And unlike their gore counterpart, or sorry, ungores, they could be used far more effectively against light cavalry because they could maybe actually catch light cavalry. Of course, they're still not going to be able to fight any kind of proper cavalry unit with that kind of stat line, but at the very least, they're still better than your classical ungores, so... They have their uses, but again, I've got to say, it feels like one of those units that should kind of be just a free thing. 120 Warhounds, for example. 
and just give your general a ton of special little abilities that you can put points into. Retinues, so to say. He brings with him, for example, a unit of Warhounds, two units of Ungol, and one unit of Ungol Raiders, for example. And uh, they would be smaller, of course. They wouldn't be the full size of the bot unit. So, say, for example, that you can buy a unit of Ungols, 240, and the retinue is 120, for example. Would make the Beastmen interesting to play, but I don't know. It seems like a really cool thing on paper, but whether or not it would play well, well... There's really no way to know from the safety of my chair right here, so... We'll have to see. Honestly, I'm not particularly optimistic that we're going to be seeing the Beastmen as a playable race anytime soon anyways, because their playstyle would be... Guerrilla warfare, essentially, and I don't really think that the current Total War engine is built for that. I'm not entirely sure they could even build a Total War engine for that. Um, maybe. I might be uh, pessimistic, but uh, we shall see. The last of the core units is the Tusk Gore Chariots, and uh, finally, we are past the chaff. The Tuscore Chariot is a shock unit, which should be pretty obvious by the picture. It is a chariot manned by angry beastmen pulled by two giant gnarly ass pigs. So, you know, you don't really want to be standing in front of this thing, and you don't, definitively do not want to be standing behind this thing, for obvious reasons, but oh well. Not like the gores give too much of a crap about personal hygiene anyways. Now. Over the years, many people have made the point that, well, you know, the Beastmen don't really like building things because building things have a strange resemblance to order and proper stuff and stuff, so it kind of seems strange that they'd be building chariots, but oh well, the details, the details. As for their use in a Total War game, though, well, pretty damn simple, really. They're chariots, but... Unlike the relatively light chariots of the elves, or even the fairly heavy chariots of the Tomb Kings, these are less so fighting chariots and more line-breaker chariots. They're there for the massive impact, rather than a continuous series of charges or even skirmishing purposes. They literally just rush into the front of a unit and try to run over as many enemies as humanly possible, and then, well, that's pretty much it. If they killed the enemy, then, voila, EB and hurrah, and all that stuff. If they got killed themselves, well, damn it. There's not a whole lot of tactical planning usually involved when it comes to a Tusk or Chariot, which makes them a little bit problematic to implement, because you kind of want to make them, you know, super heavy cavalry with a massive charge bonus, but they're also really good at melee fighting, so they don't really fit into the rather neat slots of Tomb Kings or High Elf Chariots, so not entirely sure. I think probably I'd like them to come in relatively small units of mm, 10, maybe, with a huge charge bonus, but very, 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 very little hit points, so if they get focused down by crossbows or black powder weapons, they're gonna fall apart really, really quickly, and they can't stand and fight in melee for any kind of time. Meaning that you want to use the unit as a kind of an initiation. You send in the Tusk or Chariot, it does as much damage as possible, and then very soon afterwards, you hit the unit with a unit of cores. It could be a very interesting one-two punch, where you use the Tuskors to break the enemy's formation, and then you flood in there with Gores. Now, again, whether or not Warscape is capable of simulating formations being thrown into disarray is questionable at best, but, oh well, we shall see. Otherwise, there's not that much to talk about about the Tuskor chariot, it's the large chariots, pulled by pigs, and it's very, 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 well, you know, prone to falling apart. <laughs> so, yeah, a line-breaker unit, I'd say. 
Then we move on to the special units, where we start out with the Minotaurs. The Minotaurs are a strange little unit, because, well, they're Minotaurs. They're massive, gnarly beasts, but at the same time, they're kind of glass cannons. Now, why would you say that? How the hell can a Minotaur be a glass cannon? Cannon. That sounds absolutely ludicrous. The bloody thing has three wounds, toughness four. How the hell is that a glass cannon? Well, here's the thing. Uh, the Minotaurs only have light armor. Uh, how the hell a belt qualifies as light armor is, you know, something I would never personally understand, but sure, they have light armor. And they have toughness 4, which is not fantastic by any stretch of the imagination, and three wounds. But here is the real kicker. Despite the fact that they are pretty damn excellent melee combatants, really, weapon skill 4, strength 5, toughness 4, initiative 3, attack 3. Well, initiative is still horrible, but 3 attacks is certainly a wonderful thing. And the thing that really screws them over is their leadership of 7. This means that if the unit suddenly takes a whole lot of damage via shooting, they break surprisingly easily and uncomfortably quickly. Minotaurs are not very brave creatures. They are creatures of instinct, essentially. If they see their buddies dying, more than likely they're going to think that, oh, well, shit, I shouldn't be here and leave. So, this is a real problem, because they are brutal in close combat, but how are you going to get them there? Because your opponent is of course going to go like, well, I'm not going to let that touch me now, am I? And is just going to pump them full of arrows, and with light armor and only toughness 4, you know, even short bows has a pretty damn good chance of making the Minotaurs reconsider his choices in coming to this particular spot. So, they're a little bit of a problematic unit, because normally I'd probably say they should be units of mm, 10 or so, but due to their really low leadership, I kind of want to say 20. Now, the problem is of course that they are wonderful melee combatants, but at the same time they're not that amazing, really. They hit hard, definitely, but you know. 20 of them? I think that sounds reasonable. They're still going to struggle against a full unit of 120 spearmen. They'll win, certainly, if they can get there unmolested, but with their low leadership, I do think you need to have a fair few of them so as to ensure that they don't run away. Now, of course, that is a purely tabletop problem, really, because, you know, in Warhammer games, we have seen time and time again that units will either run away at the slightest provocation, or fight to the absolute bloody last man, so, you know, that might not be a problem in uh, Total War Warhammer. But yes, they are fantastic melee units with some uh, pretty damn good rules. For example, they do have impact hit, so every Minotaur inflicts one impact hit upon charging, so they've essentially got four attacks on the charge. And of course, they cause fear, because, well, obviously. So, they are a very, very good shock unit, but it depends a lot on their implementation, whether or not they're going to be the shock unit they are supposed to be, because in current tabletop, they're just not very good. They're, they're just far too expensive for what they do, let's just uh, put it that simply. So, they really should be a shock unit, they should be a heavy charging shock unit, and they shouldn't really be all that limited. They should of course be really, really expensive, because they are a relatively rare unit, and you know, they're continuously hungry, so feeding the bastards is going to be a bit of a problem just in and of itself, but I don't think we need a cap on them, because, well, they're just, they're not that fantastic, you know? So I think it's fine to just have as many as you want of them. You could have an entire army of Minotaurs. It would be somewhat fluff correct, as it is said in the Beastman Warbuck that the 
brass bull is leading an entire army of minotaurs, so if you've got the money for it, go right ahead. Moving onwards, though, we return to the basic gores, in this case, the beastie gore. And no, at no point during this video will I be making a Beastie Boy reference. Of that, you may be assured. Anyways, the Beastie Gores are a pretty damn interesting unit because they have two-handed weapons, which is great considering they are strength 4 already, so you've got strength 5 basic unit with toughness 4, and the basic 1 wound initiative 3, but so uh, that's not great, but weapon skill 4, 1 attack, and of course that being a great weapon, so the initiative doesn't really matter. The interesting part, though, is the fact that the Beastie Gores have heavy armor. Armor scavenged from victims, essentially, that they have just, you know, clad themselves in, stapled to their bodies, and just roughly clonked on together, but nonetheless, heavy armor. Which makes them fairly unique in the Beastman army, as there's not a lot of heavy armor going on. I mean, hell, even the Minotaurs only have light armor, so heavy armor is a bit of a rarity which makes them a hell of a lot tougher than your standard gore, and makes them a pretty damn good, again, shock unit. Beastie gores should come in the units of 120 like normal, they should be somewhat limited, just because they should be really, really expensive, but otherwise you should have as many of them as you want, and they would make an excellent bodyguard unit. They should probably work much like many uh, great weapon units do currently in Total War, just as a nice, big, burly shock unit that deals a lot of damage and tries to rout the enemy nice and quick. But the Beastie Gores have a nice little special rule called uh, Despoilers. When a unit of Beastie Gores completely destroys an enemy unit in close combat, or if they defeat a unit and it breaks and flees, the Beastie Gores automatically sees any banners the unit has, any colors of fame, that kind of stuff. And in a tabletop, this means that in the next round of combat, they get to add 1 plus to their combat resolution at the end of combat, which makes them a hell of a lot more effective for every unit they beat. Now, it would be kind of cool to see this represented in a Total War game, say that if they beat an enemy unit and they rout them, they get a bonus attack, which could be really cool, so these units could snowball really, really quickly. Or even, kind of, you know, the Beastmen are the one race where I would say that it would be kind of cool to see a general being bound permanently to a unit of bodyguards. Because what you do is, you take the Beast Lord and you bind him to a unit of Beastie Gores, so they're his bodyguard. And you can't have more than their general's bodyguard unit. But every single full unit that the Beastie Gores and the Beast Lords beat, and or just rout essentially, they get a permanent bonus to their abilities. Up to a cap, of course, because, well, duh, balance. But it could make a really, really interesting and cool personalized little unit. It doesn't just have like three gold chevrons next to its name and you're like, oh, so veteran. It's got like a list of units is defeated. This unit has taken the banners of like three units of Empire Halberdiers, two units of Empire Swordsmen, a high elf banner is in there, a couple of wood elf banners, that kind of stuff. Could be a really cool unit. But whether or not, again, the Wallscape engine is even capable of that, I haven't the faintest, so. We'll see, but in their basic form, they are two handed line breakers, and they're pretty damn good at dealing with large enemy monsters, though. You've already got Minotaurs and Doombulls. You should probably be sending them to deal with large enemy monsters rather than the Beastie Calls, but you know, they can do it, certainly. And next, we have uh, quite literally the big brother of the Tusk Gore chariot, the Razor Gores. Now, the Razor Gores do not necessarily have to pull a chariot, you can have them as individual monsters. 
but they can also be used to pull the chariot of your beastman or warlord, and they're pretty damn good at it. But on the base, a Razor Gore is a fear causing strength 5, toughness 5, 4 attack monster piggy. And it is usually used as a semi intelligent guided missile. What I mean with that is, you send this giant old angry piggy hurling straight into the front ranks of an enemy unit, aiming him squarely at a special character you want to be piggy food, and you have the giant monster razor piggy eat that particular special character. And with four attacks at strength five, or technically strength six on the charge due to its special rule, it's pretty damn bloody good at eating special characters. The only exception being perhaps high elf special characters with an absolute ludicrous amount of attacks, as while it does have three wounds, I have seen high elf lords pump out in such a ridiculous amount of hits that even a Razigor missile has to be just a weensy bit careful. But a nice, soft, squishy Empire Mage, or a Battle Standard Bearer, for example, oh yes. The Razor Gore will have many munchies on his corpse. As for their implementation, I'd kinda like to see them kinda work like chariots, like have five or ten of them, and just charge them into the front of enemy units as a line breaker, and then follow up with Gores. And of course, a Razor Gore chariot would make an excellent mount for a Beast Lord. It's a super heavy chariot. Put him in a unit of Tuscore chariots, and you've got one hell of a unit. Uh, although, they should be a little bit limited. You should probably only be able to have about one or two of them per army, simply because Razor Gores are kind of rare. They're essentially Tusk Gores that have been alive for a very, very long time. And, well, staying alive for a very long time in a forest infested with beastmen and not being turned into delicious spiky bacon is a fair bit of an achievement, let's just say. Moving on from the giant spiked piglets, we have the one and only cavalry, technically, a unit of the beastmen army, the Sentigors. Now, the Centigors are different from Centaurs because they're not humans with the lower bodies of horses, they are Gores with the lower bodies of god knows what really. It does depend from Centigore to Centigore, but it's usually some kind of clawed monstrosity. So, calling it a Centigore is technically not entirely correct, but oh well. When have I never nitpicked on anything, so let's just quietly leave that one be. The Centigores are a strange unit, because you'd think they'd be pretty damn good melee cavalry, right? I mean, Centigores, they ought to be pretty damn good meleeers, but not really. Weapon skill 4, strength toughness 4, with 2 attacks? Like, that's a pretty good stat line, but not for that price and definitively not for that initiative. The Centigors are initiative 2, which means they are pretty much never ever going to be hitting anything first. And the problem with that is, well, they're expensive, and they come in relatively small units, so getting smacked in the face by an axe before you get to hit the bastard with the axe first is extremely problematic. And again, they've got light armor. You know how a belt constitutes light armor? Again, I will never understand. Details. So, yeah. Archers, crossbowmen, black powder weaponry, spears, they're really kind of vulnerable to everything. The toughness 4 is a little bit of a defense, but, but nowhere near enough to make up for the light armor. They do have a special rule, and the special rule is called Drunken. Uh, yes, Drunken. The Centigors are literally drunk. They... well, yeah. They're drunk. <laughs> what can I say? 
They're alcoholics. Raving, battered, insane, Cindy Gore alcoholics, because why the bloody hell not? But the important thing is that the drunken special rule forces you to roll a dice every turn to see what manner of effect it has. On a roll of 1 to 2, they are sobering up, and so you get to add 2 initiative, giving them initiative of 4, which is okay. It's perfectly, uh, perfectly adequate. 3 to 4, however, gives the unit hangover from hell. Which means that they suffer minus one movement, which isn't that problematic. They're already cavalry, so they move very fast, but with that, they only move as fast as warhounds, which means that if you're trying to make them run away from something, they're not gonna do it. And 5 to 6 is the best case scenario where you get drunken bravado. The unit is stubborn, which makes your leadership tests a hell of a lot easier to pass. And they've still only got leadership 7, so... The old weakness of the beastmen of low leadership is most definitively present in the Sentigors. Now, how would they be implemented into the war game? Well, part of me wants to say that they should be heavy cavalry, where the unit size is of 60, but the other part of me really does say that they are light armored cavalry, that are kind of bad at fighting, so I'd probably have to say 80, a light cavalry size, with some kind of throwing weapon. In Warhammer, they do in fact have throwing axes, which is well, essentially javelins, so you could just give them throwing axes and that would work pretty damn well, and you'd have a pretty maneuverable skirmishing cavalry unit with the potential of a relatively potent flank charge here and there that could definitively defend themselves in melee against most enemy light cavalry. Although they are going to be evaporating like piss on a pavement on a hot day if charged by heavy cavalry, so gotta keep an eye out for that. The last of the special unit are the Harpies. The Harpies are the super light flying melee units, which means that they're gonna be very, very speculative because we don't know how they're gonna do flying units. If they are simply just jumping units, then you should have like 60 or 80 even of them, if not even just a full 120. But if they can fly anywhere, they should of course be fairly small units of 20, 30, 40 maybe. Because their primary role is, of course, war machine hunters and light cavalry hunters. But they're not great fighters. No armor, strength 3, toughness 3, single wound, but to attack. So they're pretty good on the charge. They will definitely deal with light cavalry if they have sufficient unit sizes. But you probably don't want to be throwing them head-on against organized units of spearmen or anything, really. In total war terms, I'd prefer to see them as a bit of a light hit-and-run melee unit rather than a war machine hunter, because you've got the ambush special rule. And again, if you have flying units that can literally fly, it's gonna make war machines really, really difficult to use, because, you know, a unit of harpies would just jump up into the air and land on them and go like, Oh, well, it's so sad that you brought that super expensive unit of cavalry. Oh, nom 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 nom. Oh, well. But, yeah, uh, if they just have, like, a leap charge, or if they can fly really fast for short periods of time without, you know, flying so they can be intercepted, I'd be fine with them being a unit of 120, essentially making them uh, shock infantry, light shock infantry, and pretty decent anti-light cavalry units. If they can full-on fly, they should probably be limited to units of 20 or 40 thereabouts, so that while they can attack units of artillery, at the very least they can't just wipe them out instantly. Then. Moving on to the rare units, we have the Giant, which I've talked about three times at this point, so if you want to hear anything about him, go to the Orcs and Goblins army, or, you know, the Chaos army, or 
any of the other dozens of 1M armies that have access to Giant, so I'm quietly just gonna skip on to something a wee bit more interesting, with the Saigor. Because the Saigor is a quite a nifty little unit, really. I mean, it's a giant, except it's a gore, and it's also blind, well, technically. It doesn't see the material world like we do, it sees the world the way chaos sees it, it sees chaos energies, etc. And this affinity with chaos makes it extremely resistant to magic, giving it magic resistance too, so it's pretty damn hard to actually kill the bastard with magic. Additionally, it is immune to psychology because, well, it's a giant scary ass giant that sees the world through the eyes of the chaos of bloody gods. He's pretty hard to scare at this point, he's seen it all. And he also causes terror, so he is a fantastic line breaker unit. And he's really damn fast too, movement 7, so he moves about as fast as a cavalry unit. His only problems is the fact that, well, he's technically blind, and as such, he only has a weapon skill of 2, which means that he's not going to be hitting all that much. He does have 5 attacks though, and if he does hit something, he does hit them with a strength 6 attack, so if he does hit something, it is going to go squish. He's also pretty damn tough, toughness 5 with 5 wounds and leadership 8, so he's a little bit more uh, independent, so to say, than the rest of your units, not requiring quite as much babysitting. But the really cool thing is that he has some special abilities. The first one is Ghost Sight. This is the part where he sees the world through the eyes of the Chaos Gods, essentially. He sees the world as a network of Chaos Powers, because, you know, the Warhammer world is infused with Chaos Powers. All magical items are infused with the powers of Chaos. Which is yet another reason why I use the Liber Coetica, because the bloody army books use it. Well, and what this does is that when the Saigor is fighting any enemy, with any kind of magic with them, so wizards, or if they have any sort of magical item, uh, magical attacks, or if they themselves are magical, like for example if they're undead, or if they have a ward save, the Saigor may re-roll any failed to hit rolls, which means that suddenly that weapon skill of 2 is not that bad. And he's particularly nasty against dwarf armies. Oh, this is a bit of a um, questioning thing, though, because when I used to play with Beastmen, I had a friend who played Beastmen, and uh, whenever I played against him with the dwarves, yes, I'm sorry, I had a dwarven army, I was weak, <clears throat> I always house ruled it, saying that the Saigor got the ghost sight against many Dwarven units like the Iron Breakers. The reason for this is that the Iron Breakers use a ton of runic weaponry. Not the full-on runic weaponry of proper magical weapons, no, but they are still technically magical weapons. Now, you could make the argument that runic weapons are not proper magic in the way of chaos magic, and so the psycho can't see it, and that, to make it clear, is the official standpoint of the army book. They are completely separate from the system of chaos magic, and so they don't affect it, but, you know, they are magical weapons, so I find it hard to think that they don't have some kind of footprint in the warp, so to say, so I always used to house rule bad, but that is purely uh, my little quirk on the matter. Moving on though, before I get completely carried away, it has two further special abilities, the first of it being a hurl attack. The description reads, the Saigor will hurl rune-scribed boulders torn from th temples and other arcane monuments into the ranks of any who might stop them from seizing their prey. Now, how the hell the Saigor is carrying around an infinite supply of boulders carved <laughs> with magical symbols, I don't know. I mean, he's large, but 
I doubt he'd be carrying like 20, 30 stones with him, but you know, okay, fine. So, in total war terms, I suppose you could make him a bit of a stone thrower kind of thing, which could be cool, just give him extremely limited ammunition, because, well, you know, it's... There is a limit to how much that bastard can actually carry, so... Let him throw maybe five or six rocks, you know? It would be kind of cool. And the last one is Soul Eater. And uh, here we go back to how the Saigor sees the world. He sees the world in terms of magic. And uh, in terms of magic, there are none who shine so brightly as wizards. And the Saigor, well, he knows this, and he has a special interest in numbing wizards, because he figures, well, they are nice and shiny light, so the gods must be really, really happy with me if I numb it and become an even greater, bigger, shinier Saigor thingity-bop. So he has a particular passion for a bit of a magical diet, and uh, wizards know this because they have the magic side too, and uh, well, if you think the Saigor looks creepy like this, imagine what a wizard is going to be seeing, so yeah. Essentially, what this does is that any enemy wizard within 24 inches of the Saigor essentially freaks the hell out, which is, yeah. Considering the fact that if the Saigor actually manages to get his hands on the wizard, he is going to very, very slowly eat him and devour his soul, then yeah, I could understand why the wizard would just be a tiny, winty, winty bit panicked. Basically, what this does is that it makes casting spells a hell of a lot harder for the enemy wizard, but again, since we don't know how magic is going to be implemented, I'm just going to say that this should be an ability. If there's a Saigor nearby, wizards should freak out and have problems casting spells. Simple as that, really. So, I would really like to see the Saigor, just because he has a stone thrower attack, so he's a bit of a catapult, which could be damn cool. And I'd really, really like to see him be able to use that in uh, siege battles. For example, when you're doing a siege of an enemy settlement, instead of building, say, a siege tower, you can choose to build some of your construction points in building a pile of rocks for your Saigor. So your Saigor essentially goes over to the pile of rocks like, like he interacts with it, kind of. And when he does that, he gets a ton of ammunition. So now he has the ammunition count of a proper catapult, and he's essentially, at that point, a catapult, and he's firing at the enemy's walls. As for numbers, well, considering his stat line, I would say one, but considering the fact that he's a bit of a stone thrower thingy, I'd kind of prefer to see him balanced so there'd be two of them. Just because it'd be a fantastically awesome and flexible artillery unit. I mean, Total War has never seen anything like this. A giant that throws rocks? I mean, that's fantastic. Of course you want that, so... Of course, if you want one of them, you want two of them. So, I'd kind of like to see them in units of two. I lower their toughness a little bit. I don't even really need to that. I... They have light armor, so, you know, they are pretty vulnerable already. A toughness 5, of course, helps a lot, but still, a couple dedicated units of handgunners or longbowmen uh, could probably deal with them, so it's not that big of a deal, really. We'll have to wait and see, though. But uh, for the moment, we are going to be moving on to the Gorgon. The Gorgon is... well how to describe it. Um, I guess you could call it a Minotaur, but that's not strictly true. And here's why. You see, when you're reading the army books, you often come across passages like uh, the one about Bretonia and the Lady of the Lake, claiming that, you know, the Lady of the Lake is an elfin goddess. And a lot of people take that as canon, going like, oh, but it's in the army book, but... If you read closer, you will see that it says that this and this person or this and this group of people think this or teach this or consider this to be right, which leaves plenty of room for speculation. And the Gorgon is the same, because the uh, because the way it's written in the Beastman Army book, word by word, is, <clears throat> quote, 
it is thought amongst the Bray shamans that the Gorgons began life as the largest minotaurs in their tribe. Warrior lords who chose gluttony over leadership. End quote. So, again, the only thing that we have that says that the Gorgons were previously the Minotaurs is the fact that they kind of look like Minotaurs, and that the army book says that a bunch of Bray shamans think that they were probably Minotaurs. Looking after the Gorgon, you can definitely see where they're coming from. It looks like a Minotaur's, so naturally it is correct to assume that it's a Minotaur that has killed a ton of people. The Chaos God took notice and went like, oh, good boy, clap, 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 here, have a bunch of mutations. And yeah, and that doesn't sound like too bad of a theory, and it might very well be right in many cases. Personally, I kind of like to think of the Gorgons as personifications of beastmen rage and, you know, just general hatred of the world. Because Gorgons embody everything the beastmen are. They hate order. They are carnivores. They'll eat anything they come across. They'll butcher and devour everything. Their only real goal in life is to hunt and to kill. They are chaos personified, so I kind of like to view them as just that. They are the personifications of the Beastman race. Because, well, in a world like the Warhammer world, if enough Beastmen pour enough rage, hatred, and anger into the world, then it's gonna have some effect in the warp, so it's far from impossible to think that a Gorgon could be a demonic creature spawned from this very belief. Anyways, that's the version I kind of like, because, you know, it sounds cooler to me, but oh well. Back to the whole army speculation, though. The Gorgon's stat line is... Interesting, let's just say. Because on the surface, it seems rather fantastic. Movement of 7, so it's essentially light cavalry speed. Weapon skill 4, strength, toughness, and wounds, all 6, so that's amazing. And 6 attack, that sounds fantastic. I mean, what could probably be wrong with that? I mean, hell, it, it even has a regeneration special rule, although not a passive regeneration. It has uh, two abilities, one is called Swallow Hole, which is the Gorgon literally just eating a unit. It's the entire person just glomp, nom, and swallowing him. How this works is that the Gorgon might choose to use the Swallow Hole attack instead of all other of his attacks. So, instead of attacking six times, he uses one Swallow Hole. And this is essentially a 50-50. If you roll a 1, a 2, or a 3, the attack fails. If you roll 4, 5, or 6, he swallows the unit whole. And then the second special ability, Strength from Flesh, comes into being. Upon a successful Swallow Hole attack, the Gorgon regains D3 wounds that it had lost earlier in the battle. And the Gorgon might continue to do Swallow Hole, it can continuously keep doing that with a 50-50 roll and try and regain half of its hit points, so, you know, it's pretty damn powerful. And it wouldn't be too problematic to do in a Total War game. I mean, just give it a special ability that has a cooldown, it does a special ability, and it regains a random amount of hit points. Perfectly doable. But here's the thing. The Gorgon has no armor whatsoever. No light armor, he has no armor. No ward saves. No nothing. And he is a large target, which gives a plus to hit. Now, his toughness of 6 is going to protect him against a lot of incoming fire, but if you start shooting this guy with concentrated numbers of black powder weapons, longbows, or crossbows, the Gorgon is going to be brought down surprisingly quickly. And that's a lot of points spent for a unit that is so relatively fragile. I mean, toughness 6 is fantastic, 
and six wounds is great, but a good charge from a unit of heavy cavalry can surprisingly quickly kill a Gorgon. And cannonballs can deal with it very quickly indeed, so it's a very large, fantastically powerful unit that could get killed very, very quickly. So you need to be very careful with the Gorgon. And uh, being, in my opinion, Chaos Personified, they're pretty damn bloody rare. And even if you go by the other theory, then, you know, still bloody rare, so... You should probably only have available to you a couple of them. I One per army, I'd probably say. Yeah, one per army sounds good. And they should come in units of one, because... <sighs> should they? You know, I kind of think they should come in units of one because they have such a fantastic stat line, which makes them incredibly powerful, but on the other hand, they're so soft and squishy that I kind of want to say they should come in twos, but, you know, that depends entirely upon how they decide to balance ranged weapons, how powerful they're going to be. Like, in Rome to Attila, for example, javelin men are just the end-all, be-all of ranged units that can end a defensive siege battle with hundreds of kills, so... It really does depend, but... Just on the surface of things, I'd probably say they should come in units of war. Then, for the last unit of the Beastman army, it is the, uh, I don't even know, honestly. I'll, <clears throat> I'll give it a go. The, uh, <clears throat> the Jab Bersluth. And, yes, I have no idea. There's two Bs in there, for God's sake. The Jab Bersluth? The Jab Bersluth? Jab Bersluth? I don't even know. It's something, certainly. It's large, and it is ugly, and that's his thing. It's really, really, really but ugly, and that is literally its thing. Its special rule is that it enforces terror and has a so-called aura of madness, which literally drives people insane with how ridiculously ugly it is. Essentially, how it works is that every single enemy unit within 12 of the... the thing... has to pass a leadership test, and for every point by which the unit fails it test, it suffers a automatic wound with no armor saved allowed, as the unit essentially just goes insane and falls over sucking his thumb or something. He's not combat effective anymore, to say the absolute least. And, of course, for all ugly creatures, it has acid for blood, because, well, duh, that's a, that's just a science fiction thing at this point. All ugly creatures must have acid for blood, because reasons. How the hell that shit actually passes through your veins without, you know, killing you? Oh, who knows. But, oh, well. The Jabba the Hutt is a problematic unit because it has a very, very strange stat line. I mean, it's fast, strangely enough, it's really fast, it's like light cavalry fast. Weapon skill 4, strength, toughness, and wound of 5, with 5 attacks, so I mean, it hits hard, but again, it doesn't have armor. And it's still a large target, and it has poison attacks, which is great, but you know, it's not. Poison is not really a thing you usually have with high strength attacks. Oh, and it uses its tongue to catch people by just, you know, going and catching them and sucking them into its maw where it numbs them, because. Again, it needs to be a creepy creature. And so, the Jabberwocky is. Odd. I mean, how would you even implement the aura of madness in a total war game? Like, every few seconds, random people near it just kind of die? Um, I could be horrifyingly uh, imbalanced. I mean, just throw a bunch of gores into the fight and have this giant ugly bastard sit behind them, just, you know, whistling to itself or something, and just your army slowly dies around it by just. You know, looking at it and going like, oh my, that's even uglier than my ex-wife, and falling over dead, so, you know, that'd be a little bit uh, problematic. 
I would also like to see its special attack be renamed from Slithy Tongue to uh, Snarky Tongue, but oh well, that's just me. So, how do you implement the Jingle Bells monster into Total War? Well, honestly, I think you just have a unit of two of these creatures and make them line breakers. Like, really fast, or maybe a unit of one, probably, honestly. Because two of them would be uh, far too ugly. So, you have one of them, and it's just a huge line breaker. It's really, really fast, it's really, really hard hitting. It's probably a pretty good anti-cavalry unit, really, because five attacks to strength five is probably enough to break open the armor of even relatively heavily armored knights, so that might work. And just use it as a giant razor gore, essentially, a giant missile that just hammers through a unit here and there. And just ignore the aura of madness, really, or maybe it just has an aura of, you know, negative morale. Anything that's close to it is going to get a minus to their morale or something like that, a disturbing aura. Might work. But, um, other than that, I'm not entirely sure how you would implement the Justin Bieber monster. Uh, if I think the simple strategy of just making it a line breaker would be relatively effective and uh, relatively fluff friendly. I mean, I grant you it's not supposed to really work like that, but um, yeah, I think it's an okay compromise just because I haven't the faintest how you would possibly implement an aura that just randomly kills people. So uh, we will see. With that being the last unit of the Beastman army, I will be signing off right about there, as the video has gotten to a uh, decent enough length. We are closing on, on the end. We are closing in on the end of the uh, proper Warhammer armies now, so um, the last one will of course be the Dark Elves, and after that I will start just doing the random lore videos about the lesser known armies, about characters perhaps, locations, or specific points about Warhammer lore, and I'll probably dive a bit into Warhammer 40,000 as well, just because, well, Warhammer Fantasy has good lore, but Warhammer 40k has some truly fantastic lore. So, until we start on the Dark Elves, I have been Arch, thank you very much for watching, and uh, hope to see you next time. Have a good day.